Well, hello and welcome to Bread Theory. I am Zach. I am your chill companion through the world of leftist literature, usually. But tonight we continue on from where we did last week when I uh, did the very basic introduction to permaculture, to my Permaculture 101 stream, uh, which you can check out on my VODs. Still, uh, it's coming soon to the, the YouTube uploads. Uh, last time, if you recall, and if you've seen it, um, we did just a basic introduction to what permaculture is. We covered the three ethics of earth care, people care, and return the surplus towards the, the furtherance of the first two values, or fair share as it's often known. We covered um, all the different principles. There's, there's 12 in all. I'm not going to go through all of them right now, but if you have questions about them, definitely bring those up. We looked at some of the, the founding uh, thinkers in permaculture, David Holmgren, who, who came up with the concept along with his uh, research assistant. Um, or, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I got that backwards. David Holmgren was the research assistant. Bill Mollison was the, the professor in Australia who co-created the, the concept of permaculture, basically, and who wrote uh, one of the founding, or one of the, the most foundational texts. It was not the first one, but it was definitely one of the most important ones, uh, that being Permaculture, a Designer's Manual, which you can get for free as a PDF. I'll go ahead and bring that up right now just to, to remind you of where you can get that. So there you go. Um, all you, basically, all you have to do is search for Permaculture, a Designer's Manual, uh, free PDF, and it will come up and you, you get this beautiful uh, scanned copy of it. <laughs> because uh, you know it's, it's no longer in print. So even if you wanted to, there's some used copies out there, but they tend to run over $100, often over $150. So really, this is the only way that it's going to be accessible to a large chunk of people. And so it, it covers a good chunk. I, I would put it at something like 80% of what you need to know to, to start doing permaculture yourself. So that's a very important one. We covered permaculture, principles and pathways beyond sustainability. Let's make sure that's coming up right. Yep. That was the one by, that's probably the, the uh, one of the most profound texts by David Holmgren. Uh, and that just, he, he took permaculture designer's manual and broke it down into 12 principles uh, and then discussed what each one uh, is supposed to fulfill in the designing framework. <laughs> uh, and then we covered, uh, we, we started in with a lecture by Bill Mollison, which we will continue on tonight. Uh, and that was, it, it's a part of the permaculture documentary called Permaculture People. Uh, and so we'll continue with that. That's what we're going to be covering tonight to start with. Um, and just get, to give you kind of a preview of, of where we're headed tonight. Um, the next ones in the queue are going to be uh, more in-depth talk about the ethics of permaculture. Uh, we're going to talk about what permaculture is not. And then we're going to start getting into these, these really great, short, um, actual permaculture design course videos that were developed by Oregon State University eCampus. Uh, they, 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 they do these brilliant illustrations. They put them into bite-sized pieces that you can really, you know, wrap your mind around in a, in a short amount of time. These, what can be very complex uh, concepts that they're throwing out there. Um, so we have a bunch of those to, to get into. And that probably should cover the entire two hours. I plan to only go to about uh, 9 p.m. My, my time, which is Central Standard Time. So we've got about a couple hours to go here. Uh, just under and we should get through a good chunk of those because they're, they're each very short um, and then we'll get into more of the the particular techniques that, that a lot of permaculturists use such as swales and earthworks forest gardens uh, using compost as heating a, a heat source um, we'll get into Mark Shepard's uh, theory of, of uh, stun, which is sheer and total other, utter neglect. And that's how he, he breeds up very hardy, uh, well-suited to the climate, uh, different breeds of, of he, I think he's usually doing nut crops like hazelnuts, but, but all sorts of things. 
Uh, we'll get into some of the other luminaries, such as Paul Wheaton, uh, Toby Hemingway, and we'll talk more about other concepts. Uh, but we may not, we're, we're almost certainly not going to get through all of it tonight because there's a lot to cover. So there'll probably be a part three in the weeks to come. So yeah, and if at any time you have any questions, don't don't hesitate to ask. There's there's no real dumb questions. Uh, there may be irrelevant questions, like if you're just, basically, unless you're a troll or, or acting in, in bad faith, I will do my best to treat you in good faith and, and with respect and answer any questions that you may have to the best of my abilities. And I don't know everything. I'm, I'm not... I'm surely not a permaculture expert, but uh, I do have a permaculture design certificate myself. I've, I've been through the 72-hour course that was uh, laid out by Mollison. And so I know a little bit, at least, about what I'm talking about. So let's get into uh, this first video again. This is Permaculture People, Bill Mollison. Concerned that conventional agriculture erodes soils and relies heavily on external fertilizers and biocides, Bill says we have to get our houses and our gardens in order working for us or we're just going to have to continue to lay waste to all natural systems to sustain us because the system, the design we're in right now, what we do, it's just not sustainable. Basically, about 4% of us keep all the rest of us running. All essential services are covered by 4% of humanity. That's really scuffed audio. Let's That's hope a little better. Little, probably 3%. Not really an essential service to get a massage. Um, so all the food can be produced, all the energy systems maintained by a very small number of people in your community. And the closed captionings have not been great, especially when Bill is talking. It, it is obviously not tuned for uh, an American accent. All right, it is tuned for an American accent, not for an Australian one, and he has a fairly thick Australian accent. So. I apologize if things are a bit garbled, but again, you know, if anything doesn't make sense that comes up on the closed captionings, let me know, and I'll explain what he actually said. Or you can oh, rotate through that really function. Really bad audio. We'll give you examples later where to earn your income for the year costs you at least five days a month. We'll be, talk be talking about those systems. So most of the time, People are going to work, nine to five sort of work. <coughs> They're not doing a damn thing, really. It's make work. And my school teachers know they're running a vast babysitting system. <laughs> a vast, uh, that was supposed to be babysitting system, not budgeting system. So basically that, that, that sounds pretty familiar, or at least it should if you follow the, the audio or the theory streams that I do, because that's a, that's a lot of what... Um, Peter Kropotkin was talking about in The Conquest of Bread in that you are basically making your income, like you are making enough production in uh, goods or services, whatever it is that you do, in the first few hours of your work day. And the rest of the time, he calls it make work, but basically it's, it's all just profit that goes to be handled uh, however the, the boss pleases. Or not the, um, excuse me, not the boss, but the owners, however the owners please. Uh, because that is the, the owner-worker relationship. You are contracted for a certain compensation, and anything above and beyond that, the owner gets to do whatever they please with, and you have zero say about where that money goes. So th that's exactly what he's talking about. He's like, uh, all this, this extra time that, that people spend every day working, well, he says for nothing, but, but uh, that, that's, that's only half true. It, it, goes, it goes to the owners instead instead of yourself so yes it is for nothing for you for sure but uh it, it actually does um go to something it, it, it is productive to someone just not you <laughs> so but but it, it's basically the same sort of concept and so he's he's saying you know instead of doing that why not grow your own food and if we were to grow food and only do enough for ourselves basically we would be working a lot less per day um, and then if you just work just a little bit more you'd have surplus that you could then share or, or trade or sell uh, as you see fit to, to come up with uh, the cost of any expenses that you couldn't for things you couldn't produce on your own such as perhaps electricity or internet or, or transportation what have you that's all they're doing 
Yeah, candle bit the paper one to the other. <laughs> Trying to make it look important because you've got to supposedly work an eight hour day or a nine hour day for a five or a six day week. So you've got and, the, and now he's getting into uh, what are known as, as uh, bullshit jobs, as David Graeber terms them. These are, these are jobs where you literally are not doing any productive work for a large portion of your day, but because you've signed up for a 40-hour work week, you got to make yourself look busy, right? Um, and these could also be jobs that are just to uh, make higher-up people look important say, so they can say, you know, I have... 10, 20 people working beneath me. Um, it also gives them cushion when there, there comes to be budget cut times. So where are you going to cut first? Well, obviously, the, the people that literally are not producing anything other than, you know, making you look better. And then you can pat yourself on the back and look good to your bosses by saying, hey, look, I cut out 10 jobs when really they weren't jobs that should have been there uh, to begin with. They were just there for your aggrandizement. So, yeah. It's about to appear to be busy. If you didn't have to appear to be busy, you could go home most days. Um, so most of us are out there trying to look as though we're busy. And, and on, honestly, what we do most of the time is make work, make inessential work. But, but that means that only 2% of us gardening at any one time can easily feed all of us. And it's a trivial exercise. It's not difficult at all. It would take you about half an hour to teach somebody to plant how, how to plant six months food. It takes them 40 minutes to plant it. See how long it takes you to go down to Walmart and come back. <laughs> so in the same time it takes you to go and shop at Walmart, you could have planted six months food and never go back to Walmart again. So it's trivial. And, and, and the systems that permaculture promises, you do a lot of this work up ahead of time, organizing, you know, like your big crops, you do your big earthworks and that sort of thing, like, like moving around, uh, re-contouring things, perhaps digging ditches and, and berms. That's, a, that's, another, con, um, that's another common uh, technique that, that we'll cover later on. Um, you do all that stuff at the very onset, and then from that part, from that point out, things begin to get easier as systems start coalescing around one another. Um, trees, bushes, uh, uh, ground covers, all, all the different layers start, start filling in the different niches and, and working in cooperation with one another. One may shade another, one may provide nitrogen for another. So, um, and then when it comes to things like... Um, the need for different biocides, your herb herbicide and your pesticide, uh, you instead have uh, techniques like uh, filling in every niche so that there's not space for weeds to come in. And that's one thing that most people probably don't know is that a lot of, uh, almost all weeds are weeds of the margins. They, they purposely, okay, not purposely, but, but their, their survival strategy basically is to, to find land that has been disrupted in a way. Maybe there's been a, a, a mudslide. Maybe there's been a, a big fire. Uh, maybe there's been a huge windstorm that's, that's blown down a lot of the trees. They go into those spaces and they start colonizing it, basically. And they will fill in every bare patch of soil. You, you, you've perhaps heard the term, nature hates a vacuum. Well, that's exactly the sort of thing that that means. Uh, bare soil, unoccupied ground, in the in the mind, well, not in the mind, but in the in the way that nature behaves, is seen as a vacuum. It's something that needs to be filled, and so things will come and fill those niches. And as as things start to fill those niches, if we can instead have them be things that we want rather than things that we don't necessarily want, then there's a lot more competition keeping out. The, the stuff that we don't want. It's, it's a much more resilient way of doing things. It takes less management over time. And as well, you start to build habitat because you're having more of a, a, a mimicked or constructed ecosystem. You start to have habitat for various species that will come in and do work for you where a pesticide might otherwise be needed. If you have a, a field that's just corn, you can't really rely on spiders or 
various uh, mammals or, or, or birds or whatever to be able to, to just fly mile after mile over cornfields to find the, the pests they would otherwise eat. Instead, if you have a habitat right there, that's a, that's a lot more places, first of all, for these, these animals and, and um, insects to, to make their home. Uh, but it also gives them a, a base to go out and find the, the things they like to eat, which are things that you probably don't want, and then go back. It, things become uh, set into a dynamic equilibrium, it's called. So there's just the, there's, you know, if any one pest gets uh, too high in numbers, well, that's, you know, then the, the buffet, the banquet for whatever sort of predator is nearby that feeds on them. So then they'll uh, reduce those numbers naturally, and then with less food, the, the predator species goes back down, and it just, it, it, eventually it, it achieves basically an, a, what's known as a dynamic equilibrium. Um, so because of all these things, you're doing a whole lot less work. You're having other organisms be your co-creators and your co-gardeners, basically. One, one thing that Bill Mollison says a lot is everything gardens. And it's absolutely true. But to truly exercise, to design energy-efficient housing, there's so much of it now that works so well, it's really trivial. I'm not talking about things which are intellectually difficult or physically difficult to do. And if you've got your gardening over with between, say, the ages of 18 and 20, and you spend an extra day and cut yourself a house, or made enough bricks to build that house, and that takes one day for a two-storied house, you more or less finished work as far as housing and food goes. And if your house is energy efficient, you'll finish work there. So then you think, what can I really, what did I really want to do with my life? <laughs> Certainly it wasn't sit in some, some oversized car crate, uh, paying it off your whole life. Is that what you wanted to do with your life? No, you know, you can't imagine possibly what it is you would like to do with your life. Certainly, uh, not paying off rubbish. It's rather amusing to think about a house. You know, your great-grandfather builds a solid brick house and uh, he dies. You decide, you know, as a date of, you'll sell the house and take the money, so you do. Then someone comes along and they have to buy the house. Meanwhile, it's going to cost them more than what it cost your great-grandfather because uh, it cost him very little. <coughs> so he, he, they charge double for it, so they pay for it double again. But what they get is exactly the same house, and it's slightly deteriorated. And then it goes on sale after sale after sale. Isn't, isn't that funny how they can basically create money out of nothing? Like, the bank is not improving the home each time. Um, land assessors are not improving the land each time. In fact, as he says, things are physically deteriorating, and yet you'll, you'll see homes go for higher and higher rates just because they're in more demand. It has nothing to do with, with any sort of grounded value of a particular piece of property. Um, interesting thing to think about. If you talk to land agents, they'll point to houses which they personally have sold eight or nine times, and every time it costs more and more and more. And those houses, which start off at $9,000 in Grandpa's day, get up to a quarter of a million dollars. Same old house, been paid for a lot of time. <laughs> it's called a pyramid scheme. It, it, it is. It, you know, you have to draw back from it all and think about it, because why in the hell would you ever pay for anything again? Exactly. Why? What exactly is being created to, to increase that value? You may say it's in a more of an in-demand place, but that's, that, 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 that does nothing for the actual house, the actual structure, the actual land itself. It's, it's just, it's one of those things where they're just extracting money out of thin air, basically, based on this idea that because something is more desirable, it's, it's therefore worth more. Your, your great-grandfather paid for it. You, 
you don't have to pay for it. But if you want to go on paying and paying and paying and increasing the amount you pay, you spend your whole, generations of people spend their whole lives paying for things which were paid for when they were built. Except in some cultures they don't. Like, you know, just back from Austria, people live in the houses their great-grandfathers built. You know, they don't pay any, a penny for that house. You're just born into the thing. You know, 20 or 30 of the families live there. They've always lived there the last 5,000 years. The house doesn't cost you anything. Your job doesn't cost you anything. It's all there. And it's about all to end. And, and just think how empowering that sort of thing, that sort of a, a, a situation is. Think about not having to pay for the place that you live. I mean, I, I can pretty well guarantee that, that everyone listening or watching, uh, you pay for the place you live in one capacity or another. Um, you know, very few people are at the point where they've actually paid off their, their house, if they even are lucky enough to be able to own a house themselves and if you don't own a house then you're paying someone else's mortgage but how freeing would that be if you had that extra money every month that you could invest in in other things perhaps you wouldn't need to take the same sort of job that you have perhaps you'd actually have some some freedom to look around some time some some breathing room to find something that you enjoy more or that that provides for you whatever it is you're looking for in employment Ownership is, is a real kind of freedom. And so if, if we're going to build any sort of, of egalitarian society, any sort of society that uplifts the best in people, we have to provide these sorts of basics, such as housing, uh, to break this cycle of, of banks constantly extracting profit out of nothing. Like, like literally, if a bank takes over a house that's foreclosed on, they're not going to put anything into that house to make it worth more, and yet somehow it ends up being worth more at the end. Um, they're not adding value to society, but people having houses that they can rely on, that they know that no matter what happens, they will be there for them. That adds value to society, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, and I, I think permaculture is a good way to to help people along that course because what permaculture focuses on mainly is food production, but it can also be um, any number of products. It doesn't have to just be food. You know, they, they talk about the the five Fs. You know, uh, of food, fodder, which is food for animals, fiber, fuel, and pharmacy. You can get all those sorts of different yields from your same property and potentially from the same plants that you have you know you have a maple tree you can get quality timber from it eventually but in the meantime you can get uh, sap once a year that you can turn into uh, maple syrup or um, any number of products maple water you know maple sugar um, and that's just one example so I think permaculture fits really well with with leftist sorts of ideas um, of really empowering people who, who really need it the most, who are, who are struggling day to day at their very low paying jobs uh, just to survive, perhaps having to have two or three jobs just to survive. And, you know, helping people provide for themselves is, is real liberation. Uh, so we had it right. You didn't waste your life paying for something which took you know, less than a year. My grandfather built a house for a bet in two days. And it's still standing. For a bet? For a bet. <laughs> yeah. On a bet is what he said. Took me a week. <laughs> I thought it was pretty clear. Um, now, when you look at a whole system, there are two things that are undesirable in the system. One is work and the other one is pollution. But as soon as you see work, you will get pollution. 
Pollution is a product of work. Work is a result of not supplying any com every component of your system with its needs. Now, let's put that in way. If you didn't put a tank on your chicken house, you've got to carry water to the chickens. So you incur work when you've not designed a way in which the components of your system can attend to their own needs. So what he's basically saying is work is a result of poor planning, uh, poor design strategy, which is, is everything that, that permaculture strives not to be. It, it strives to be good design from the beginning so that you save yourself work in, in every facet of your life. Um, and then that just increases as time goes on and, and things start working for you. Um, the ecosystem starts working for you. So he, he gave the example of, of putting a tank on your chicken house. You know, that, that, that'd be a tank of water. Presumably, that would catch some of the water that, that falls from the sky in whatever precipitation it may be. And perhaps even automatically feeds it into a water dispenser that the, the chickens can then take water as they need. So you could have that same system but have that tank on your house and have to fill that tank every time in a bucket, bring it and haul it all the way out to the chicken house. Same exact components, same amount of work needed to do both things. And yet one, you're going to have infinitely more work because you're hauling buckets out year after year to, uh, to uh, provide for your chickens when it could have just all happened right at the, at the place that they need it. So that's the sort of things that he's talking about that, that permaculture can help correct and, and plan for. Now, if you don't collect the eggs from the chicken house, that's pollution. So pollution is an unused resource. It didn't go somewhere where it would be used. So that if and, and this is the, the concept uh, that, that David Holmgren, his grad student, distilled into produce no waste. Um, because waste is, is oftentimes, not always, but, but oftentimes a product of, of just having things in the wrong place. You know, it's a missed, it's a wasted opportunity. So, talking about eggs right there. Eggs are something that are in demand. They will, they will be in demand for the foreseeable future. People like to eat eggs. If you don't take the time to collect those eggs, they become rotted, they, they foster disease. Um, they, they don't do anybody any good, really. I mean, some of them, sure, will be incubated, and that's, that's a separate matter, but just talking about all the extra eggs, because chickens tend to produce, on average, one egg per day when the... When the during the summertime. So that's a lot of eggs that are never going to be fertilized, never going to produce chicks. They will, they will just go to waste unless you use them. Okay? Um, but it could be things like manure. If you, if you look at uh, a high-density feedlot of any kind, whether it's cows, whether it's pigs, which those things are, are real menaces to the, the towns that they are in, um, I'm, I'm told, I've never experienced it firsthand, but I'm, I'm told by people who have that it's, it's the most unbearable stench for miles around to the point where it just it shuts down all of any town life if it's near a town and people are just going to go out of their way to avoid it if it's out in the country. But um, that's all just because of excess animal poop, basically. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. What if instead we looked at that as a resource? Because that ha all that animal nu uh, nutrients, or all those nutrients that are contained within that animal waste, could be going to feed the soil again, you know? And they could be raised in a way where, you know, they even in fact distribute that manure just by living. I mean, that's how things function naturally in an ecosystem. You take the, the Great Plains of, of the Midwest of the United States, bison were the, the dominant um, herbivores, okay? So they would eat 
the grass down. They would they would move in very compact herds. They would eat these paths across the the, the prairie, and as they're eating stuff down, they're also pooping, and then they're stomping that into the ground. And then, um, as uh, you know, that gets worked into the soil, that produces fertilizer for the next generation of of wildflowers and wild grasses. We can do that sort of a system with with our raising of animals now. Okay, we can have uh, pastured. It's it's generally termed pastured. Uh, meat production or milk production where you have them out on the land as they normally would be in nature um, without any human intervention is what I mean to say Uh, and yeah you can keep them tightly close together as they would be in nature due to or as they naturally would be due to things like predator pressures there's always a lot more safety if if a, a herd animal stays together very tightly uh, it's less chance of, you know, the young and the sick being able to be picked off easily. Um, and then it's a lot more eyes, you know, searching the, the horizon for any sort of predators. These sorts of things. So that's that's the natural behavior when there's predator pressure. And most grassland systems have adapted to that sort of cycle. So if we do that with instead cattle or pigs or whatever, we can run them from, from tight enclosed pasture to tight enclosed pasture in uh, just enough time so that they, they graze through as if they were, you know, moving across the, the Great Plains, right? Um, and again, they'll, they'll poop, they'll distribute the, the fertilizer for the next generation of grass, they'll pound it into the soil. You can even, um, there's, there's a technique where you can then wait in uh, the, uh, the correct number of days where naturally flies would have laid their, their larvae into the, the cow patties and they would just be emerging, and then you can run chickens through, and the chickens will scratch through the manure, distributing it even further, and at the same time taking out those maggots. So you're, you're eliminating local fly problems at the same time. No extra work needed. Just a little bit of extra management, moving them from place to place, rather than just confining them to one big mud pit where they just sit in their own poop day in and day out and have pretty awful lives from everything that I can tell. Um, Instead, they get to be outside, uh, relatively uncontained, in in a a pretty close facsimile to how things would be if they were just out roaming the wilderness. Um, It sounds like a step up to me. And this is is one of the promises of permaculture, is, is just thinking these things through ahead of time and designing it right to less than the work you need to do. Because let's go back to the, those, they're called CAFOs, the, the uh, oh, confined animal feeding operation, I think is, is the, the acronym. But when they're, they're well, the industrial way of doing it is putting them all together, putting out mostly corn, which they're not even meant to eat. It's just a filler that, that fattens them up quickly and it's cheap available food that they can put into the cows. Um, so they're eating corn most of their life um, and they're just standing in their own poop. And then eventually, I, I would assume, you have to, to pay someone to come in and take out as much of the effluence as they can and then distribute it out to, to other farms, supposedly. Um, I think that's how it's done. But maybe they just stay in these, these terrible lagoons of manure um, and then eventually are covered over. I don't, I don't quite know. But, but regardless, it's going to be more work than if you just naturally distribute it by them walking from place to place right you know so we're talking about making less work for ourselves in the long run by designing smart the first time if you collect the eggs they're no longer a pollutant they are a resource and so it goes so work and pollution are both faulty design symptoms so that, that will lead us later to methodologies of design. Again, design has not been defined by people. We've defined it here. We design for functional relationships in whole systems that will save energy. Uh, if we fail in design, we'll incur work and we will certainly incur pollution.
Permaculture mimics ecosystems, reducing the need for inputs, and it avoids synthetic fertilizers and biocides. And permaculture is used for more than just agriculture. For instance, it's also used to design sustainable buildings. Permaculture is an ecological design science that seeks to mimic nature in the way that we design food systems. We've got some pretty serious problems when it comes to agriculture. We're losing a massive amount of topsoil from our industrial farm systems. And what happens is that topsoil runs away into our rivers, lakes, and streams and creates all kinds of issues with algae blooms, uh, water pollution issues, and things like that. And really what permaculture seeks to do is mimic nature's brilliance that we would find in a forest. And we know that a forest produces no waste. There's no such thing as garbage in nature. So we can mimic that when we design what we call permaculture food forests or perennial polycultures. And a perennial polyculture means lots of different trees, lots of different bushes working together um, in a closed loop system where the output of one plant becomes the input of another. And when we design these systems, what we're finding is that these types of agricultural implementations take far less water, take far less fossil fuels. And what we're seeing after a couple of studies done on small scale organic biodiverse farms is they actually outproduce traditional agriculture calorie for calorie. So we're seeing a lot of examples emerge. Isn't that cool? Like you can actually outproduce the, the conventional methods um, with less machinery as well. So when you take into those, uh, when, you, when you take into account those sorts of um, energy inputs, and if you're looking at the, the, the caloric value of the, the fossil fuels you're putting into managing your system, it's, it's much more productive per input than, than a conventional farming method because you're doing most things by hand or maybe once in a while using a piece of machinery, mostly to like haul something or, or, or move a piece of equipment out onto a field or something like that. But it's not as much, there's almost no, uh, usually no mechanical tilling or cultivation or seeding or harvesting or any of that sort of thing because these are perennial plants you can't really be trampling them all the time for one thing. You can't be cutting them up for another. Um, so that just takes plowing right out of it because you're just working against yourself if you have perennial crops. Um, and then at the same time, there's there's easier ways of seeding that, that don't require heavy ma machinery that people can do just on their own. Um, ooh, I should add it to the queue at some point here, but there's a, there's a really cool technique called uh, seed ball manufacture. And it was developed, as far as I know, it was first developed by this guy, Masanobu Fukuoka, who was a Japanese man who, who developed this system called the, the um, do-nothing method. And he put it all into a book called The One Straw Revolution, which, in fact, let's bring that up right on the, the screen right now. That's another great resource. One Straw Revolution. I believe there's actually, in fact, free PDFs of that as well. Mr. Fukuoka died in the early 2000s, I think. So, yeah, here we go. One Straw Revolution from the Soil and Health Library, which is a great resource for permaculture stuff. Uh, But anyway, the, the One Straw Revolution, he, he, one of his key techniques, oh yeah, Larry Korn, who's also sadly passed away, um, one of his key techniques was, was a seeding method called using seed balls. And basically you take, oh, I don't remember the, the mixture, but you take like the, the highest percentage part um, clay, uh, and it can just be a local clay that you dig from the ground. Uh, and then you take... Um, a little bit of manure, um, like processed manure. You don't want to have fresh stuff. That, that'd be too harsh on the seeds. But you take manure that's been processed, that's sat for perhaps a year, depending on, on what type it is, perhaps more years, um, that's been composted anyway. You take some of that. And, it, and you could just use compost as well, if that's all you have available. 
you, you take a, a much smaller part of that, you add it in, and then you add the seeds in, and you put it, um, there's different ways you can do it. You can just kind of smash it all together and roll out uh, these, these clay pellets one by one by one. Or what he would like to do is he put it in this little hand concrete mixer. So it was, you know, you know, four foot wide opening, put all the different ingredients in equal in the, in the proportions they were supposed to be. Ah, thank you very much for the lurk, Alyosha. Um, if you, if you are in the audience as well, you should follow Alyosha, a very great leftist content creator, does a lot of cool stuff about, uh, U.S. politics, especially, um, and I've been enjoying your, your shows recently, Ali. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, but anyway, so, so you're, you're putting all your ingredients into the small hand concrete mixer, you tumble everything together and just, it naturally starts forming these, these, these clay pellets with the seeds inside and a little bit of, of fertilizer for them. And then you let them dry in the sun for a little bit until they're a hard ball. And then you can take them by the handful and just kind of fling them out onto the, the, the countryside, wherever it is you want to plant that particular crop. Or it could be a number of crops that you put all together. It, it all depends on what your goal is. But you just fling them out by hand. And you can, you can cover large areas um, all at the same time. Ah, oh, return from the vacay. Good to see you back, Allie. Uh, anyway, so, so you're, you're, you're doing this all by hand. And you can cover entire farm fields. Like, like as, as much as you could then manage on your own with you and your family. Right? And the, the, the beauty of these, these, these clay pellets, these, these seed balls, or seed bombs as they're often called, is that uh, if you were to just scatter the seed, for one thing, you're not going to get the distance because there's not the mass to it that you have in the seed pellet. But for another thing, birds, like he, he described uh, these birds that would follow him along as he was like spreading his rice and stuff, uh, and they would just see where he spread it, and they would go hunt through the dirt, right behind him, scratch it up and eat his rice. So, well, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a huge amount of wasted seed right there. So you have to plan for, for more seed than you actually need. It just, it's just, it, it's waste compounded upon waste upon, compounded upon waste. Um, but instead with these seed balls, because they've been hardened into the clay, if, a, if an animal were try, to try to eat it, they, they couldn't penetrate it. So what, what, what finally unlocks it? How does the seed then get back out if it's in this, 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 sun-baked pellet. Well, what happens is as soon as the rains come in sufficient amount, they'll begin to melt away that clay. You know, a little while. So we're not, we're not firing it so it's like a piece of, of, of clay pottery. It's just hardened a little bit. It's dried out. And then when, it's, when you add water to it through the rains that those seeds are going to need to start germinating, uh, it's going to start melting away. And there's also that little packet of, of nutrition in there for it. So you don't have to go back over your field a second time with fertilizer and it has everything it needs to start out. Um, so that, that, yeah, that's the, that's the clay pellet method. And it's, it's, he was, he was developing this system independently of, of permaculture, but it certainly fits into the permaculture framework quite beautifully. Let's get back to the video. Uh, let's put this one over with the other books. One second, and we'll get back to the video then. So yeah, so we're talking about doing less work with, with the available tools and equipment that we have. And in this case, just when we're talking about seed bombs, just basically your hands and perhaps some very low-tech machinery to, to help you out. ...of farmers that are embracing this bump the volume back up again. ...combining agriculture and ecology uh, with a far less footprint, far less fossil fuels, far less water. And the food is actually healthier. The food is actually a lot more nutrient dense. So we're seeing some very viable solutions emerge with permaculture, and it's all based on mimicking nature. Hi, Jeff Lawton here. Jeff Lawton is is um, basically the the one of the the I guess most brightest students that that Bill Mollison had personally. Uh, he's he's the person that. Um, he conferred the, the, the title, you know, he's, he's, he likes to have a sense of humor about things, so he's not being totally serious, but he basically dubbed him the Prince of Permaculture, okay? He was the one of all his different students and all the different people that he worked with that he wanted most to carry on his legacy when he was gone. Uh, Bill Mollison was, was born in the, in the 1920s, and he died recently in 2016, so he almost made it to, to 100 years old. 
Um, but he knew that he was going to have to pass on his legacy and, and keep this going. There's, there's no such thing as a sustainable movement if you can't literally sustain the movement from generation to generation. Um, so this is the, this is the, the guy that he, he passed it on to. He's done some brilliant work with, with especially dry lands permaculture, going to some of the most arid places on earth and getting them to grow uh, luscious, bountiful crops of, of fruit and, 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 and vegetables and nuts and all sorts of things, basically in, in compacted desert soils where they, they might get, you know, 10 inches of rain, 14 inches of rain in an entire year. And just through managing it in a different way and, and, and putting things together in a smart configuration, he managed to, to get things to grow without any irrigation, or fertilizer, or pesticide, or herbicide, or any of that stuff that conventional farmers have to do. You, um, I don't think I have it in. Oh, I don't think I have it in this queue. Um, but I, I will definitely add it to the queue if I don't have it. Um, he did, he has a brilliant video called "Greening the Desert," where he goes through all the stuff that he did out in these arid lands, and it shows really if permaculture can produce fantastic results in in the most harshest con conditions. Think of what it can do in places that are much milder. I think it's a really good case study. And this is a very sad time because Bill Mollison, the father of permaculture, and my teacher, my good mate, mentor, and, and in the last few courses that Bill taught, my co-teacher, Bill's passed on. And he's left us with an incredible legacy, the permaculture design system, which is really a, a revolution. I, I believe it's an evolution. It's the evolution of human thinking. It's the way we can turn things around. We can be the most beneficial, the most productive, but environmentally recreative. We can be the element that repairs the earth while we supply our own needs. And this is what Bill's left us with. And this, this is the turning point. This is the point where we need to make a decision. Are we gonna do this? Are we gonna use this incredible design science that begins with ethics? This ethical design science, are we going to use this to repair the earth so it can go, go on indefinitely for the future generations? We have the capability to create such an abundant living system. A system that's presently unimaginable. Or are we... Except for you went a long way to make the unimaginable tangible and real as have, have countless others. They, they've really proven since uh, the 1970s when this concept was first uh, proposed, they've really proven the, 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 uh, just how valuable this design system is and how much it, it actually can work to heal the damages that, that um, modern industrial agriculture has done to the world. And at the same time, bring people closer to the natural systems that they literally depend on, because we all do. Are we going to carry on in this destructive mode, not really caring that our actions are going to create a situation we really don't want to really understand? I think this is the time when all caring, thinking people need to jump on the team of permaculture. I'm, I'm, and get this done. We don't need any permission. It's always been, as Bill called it, peaceful sedition. You don't need authority. We can do this for ourselves. No one's going to come along and do it for us anyway. It looks, it looks like we are going to have to do it for ourselves. We can. We can turn all the principles into directives to act. And that's what Bill wanted. Bill always used to say, as about how much information you have, information that is not acted on is useless. We need to take action. We need to go into action.
Mm. And that, that's true no matter what your political leanings are or your goals as, as whatever sort of activist you believe in. Um, you could read all the theory in the world and, and it doesn't do any good unless you're doing something with it. And, you know, to be fair, just what he's doing right now, spreading information, what, what I'm trying to do, what other Twitch streamers, YouTubers, people that, that are active on whatever platform there is, sharing information is an action. So, so let's be clear about that and, and bring some balance to it. But just keeping, just reading just for yourself, just taking information just for yourself, that's okay. But ultimately, if, it, if your goal is to make the world a better place, you have to at least help others to that same information. Many of the people in permaculture have contacted me and said, we feel more committed now. We've got to get this done. So let's do it. Let's get on with it. Let's fix the world. Let's create that abundance that we know is possible, even though we can't even imagine it. Let's do it for ourselves. Let's do it for our families. Let's do it for our community. And let's do it for the future generations. The children of the world deserve it. So I just found out that Bill Mollison passed away last night peacefully in Tasmania. And, uh, it's very sad news, obviously, because of how much good this man's done to humanity and the world. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like, I want to make this video to honor him and to, uh, encourage you all to study permaculture. Because it's the, it really is the true solution. Practical answers that everyone can take right now to manifest the greatest life ever. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank Bill Molson for all the uh, hope he's provided me. And all the knowledge he's provided me. What are we doing, everyone? It's disgusting the way we are living. <laughs> Slavery, violence, and environmental destruction. We need to think and act our way out of this madness. And that's what permaculture is about. Thinking and acting our way out of this insanity. So thank you, Bill, for everything you've done. For me and my life personally. And for so many others. We won't let you down, man. I will continue to dedicate my life to promoting permaculture as the foundation for everything we want our lives to be. Many thanks, much love, and much encouragement. Thank you. Yeah. Be beautifully said. You know, I, I don't particularly know who that person was, but they were speaking from the heart, obviously, and, and permaculture had a big impact on their life, the way it's had on mine and, and millions upon millions of others. And... Yeah, Bill did a, a, an incredible service to the world, um, along with, with David Holmgren um, and, and everyone that, that's come after them as well, uh, or at least a great many of them have come after and, and been inspired by uh, what they put into the world. So, so yeah, I think there's going to be some music here. I may, I'm just going to have to mute it for a second so I don't get the, the DMCA. Um, so, so this is the prime directive of permaculture. The only ethical decision is to take responsibility for our own existence and that of our children and, and children being, you know, collectively all of our children. And so w whether you even physically have children or not, whether you care for anyone else, the idea is to stop, stop kicking the can down the road, stop saying, well, s future generations will deal with this act now do what we can to to learn these techniques and these principles and and uh, design framework uh, principles um, and put them into to practice so that we can have a, a an abundant earth to live on for future generations as, as at the same time at least start to address uh, catastrophes that are already gripping us such as climate change um, such as as war famine uh, all sorts of horrible human tragedies that, that take place around the world. So many of them can be addressed by uh, these, these permaculture ideas and philosophies. Oh, that was cool. I think that was his, uh, part of his Global Gardener 
series of videos. Another fantastic one. Man, there's a whole bunch I'm going to have to line up right now. Let's look up uh, that right now. Here we go. Looks like there, in fact, is a daily motion video of it. Global Gardener, fantastic series of videos. It really is what... It was the, the very first thing that, that introduced me to permaculture at all. I, I mean, before I had even really any sense of what it was, um, this this series of videos. I, I don't know if it's a series or if it's just one video, but anyway, I, I had a, a group um, in college and we played this uh, video and it, uh, yeah, it really changed my, my understanding of it. Um, but this, he was talking about how in this particular uh, space, he's like, hey, look, if, even if you just have a balcony, you can do so much. You can grow so much food with it. And he, he went on the, the vertical with that lattice work that you see off to the side there. He had, you know, uh, a raised bed of, of various herbs and vegetables. He even put a fish tank out there. So he, he was getting um, yet another source of, of food and, and um, different sort of <laughs> super microclimate going. He's like, hey, look, there's, there's, you can have abundance everywhere. And if everyone does a little bit, it's not going to add up to, to all of it. You know, there's, there's probably no truly urban space that can provide 100% of its food. But we can, we can definitely get closer than we are now. And, and every little bit counts. Every little, every acre that we, we um, you know, shoehorn into an existing city uh, and, and get an acre of, of, of one produce or another out of, is an acre that doesn't have to be put under the plow out in, in farm country. It's, it's land that can stay wild. Um, and it's, it's a lot less energy that needs to be used for transport and processing and, and packaging and marketing and, and all these sorts of things that, that go into the supply chain of getting it, that, that food from far-flung uh, farms, some of them perhaps around the world, uh, to your table. So instead we're, we're cutting out Dozens of middlemen, basically, um, even for just a, a small portion of, of the food that we need. But it, it makes a difference, and it can definitely add up if enough people do it. It's a, it's a moving tribute. You should probably, I, I encourage you to go back and, and look at this video yourself. But I just can't risk the DMCA. And there we have the cover of Permaculture Designer's Manual. Lots of symbolism in that imagery with the, the rainbow snake, which is a, a aboriginal concept of a snake in the dream time um, that forms both an egg and an infinity symbol and also a skull. So it represents the full cycle of life. Um, you have the trees providing abundance. You have many different things. Though the problems of the world are increasingly complex, the solutions remain embarrassingly simple. Bill Mollison. I think that's a... That's a one that's really stuck with me through the years. Um, people's natural inclination when, when they have a problem, especially something like a landscaping problem or a food production problem, is to add more complexity. More complex machines uh, that do more uh, individualized tasks, more, more hyperly specific tasks, um, more energy poured into management, you know, to, to just keep everything out that you don't want and only include the stuff that you do want. And it's just, it's, it's so much waste that's happening through that sort of thinking. Um, when the solutions, as you say, are, are quite simple. Uh, you have these unique technologies, pieces of technology, if you will, in uh, plants and animals that will just of their own volition organize themselves um, fill spaces, fill roles, uh, provide things for you and, and for other living things uh, without you doing anything more than just setting them in the right spot. That's, that's pretty incredible. There's no, there's no piece of uh, human-made technology that does the same sort of thing that's that self-organizing and spreading. Um, so yeah, pretty, it, it can be pretty simple as long as you work with the natural forces of nature instead of against it. Yeah. Cool stuff. Bill Mollison, really great guy. Uh, tribute by Charlie McGee. 
<laughs> I hesitate to put even another link in this, but uh, Charlie McGee came out with a an album, um, and he took David Holmgren's book, the the print the Permaculture Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability, which had the twelve design principles distilled from Bill Mollison's book. So we took each of those twelve principles, Charlie McGee, the, the musician, did, and he made a song about each one. And they're really catchy, especially things like waste um, and yield. That I think yield is my favorite one that he's done, and he called it Permaculture: A Rhymer's Manual. Uh, so that's it's really good. I highly recommend it. So I'll, I'll put up that link right now too. So he's got a Bandcamp page there. The band is called Formidable Vegetable Sound System. He's an Australian guy. He's really cool. I have no idea if his music would bring up a DMCA flag, but I'm not going to chance it. So I'll just leave it to you to go and uh, look for yourself. So I'm going to put the link up there in chat. Okay, moving on to our next video. We're going to be learning about the ethics of permaculture. Let's get a little bit more in depth, kind of flesh out the, the three main ethics of permaculture to help you kind of understand them and, and more ingrain them into your, your mind as you think about permaculture concepts. Hi, Jeff Lawton here, and I'm back with another video. Today, I'm going to answer some of the most common questions regarding the ethics of permaculture. Ecological principles rest on the understanding of life where cycles, flows, systems and functions work ceaselessly through sound natural laws. Adherence to a set of foundational ethics helps guide behaviour and builds cooperation and trust within communities. The following set of ethics calls for nature-centred practices that allow for regeneration of land and those who live on it. The three permaculture ethics are earth care, which includes all living and non-living things, land, water, animals and air, people care, to promote self-reliance and it make things better for people, community responsibility. And then the third ethic, return of surplus. This happens as, as a result of adherence to the above ethics, the first two ethics, which together caring for the earth, caring for people, and allowing the surplus to support earth care and people care. Find me a leftist philosophy that doesn't believe in those three ethics. I mean, if, if they're out there, then they, I, I would hesitate to even include them as leftists because you can't just not care about the earth. That's, that's future generations. That's, that's your ability to, or, or future generations' ability as well as your own, to care for themselves, to, to, to have enough food, shelter, water, um, all the necessities of life. If you don't care for the earth, all of that goes out the window. So at the very least, if there's a leftist philosophy that, that believes in such things, they're, they're being very short-sighted um, and should not be taken seriously. Or they should be, you know, made aware that, hey, <laughs> this is not going to last very long if you only focused on, say, things like workers' enfranchisement and industrial production and, and that sort of thing. Um, you have to have it all. And then people care. What's, what's more leftist than people care? That, that, I mean, that's it. Egalitarianism, um, mutual aid, which, which also really ties into return of surplus. The, these, these philosophies are, are really meant for each other. Um, I can't see having, I really can't see one functioning well without the other, in fact. Um, if you do permaculture without any sort of care for class struggles or liberation or any of that sort of thing, if you just, if you take the, I mean, there are quite a number of, of right libertarians that have gotten into permaculture and they just do homesteading for their, their, and their own and their kin, basically, or themselves and their kin. That's that a poor phrasing. But, uh, they're very isolationist in the, in the way they think about it. They think about it as survival. There's, there's a, a very popular podcast called The Survival Podcast that, well, the guy has some really good information about permaculture. His politics, his, his right libertarian politics are just so insufferable that, that I had to give that up many years ago, which is a shame because, like I said, very knowledgeable guy, has some brilliant ideas, um, but he kind of represents that, that vein of permaculture 
practitioners, even if you want to call them that, who uh, basically would look at earth care as caring for the earth that they control, people care caring for the people that are in their family or their immediate friend circle um, or their, their political allies, and then return of surplus. I don't even know how they factor that one in. Um, charity, maybe? I don't know. And libertarians tend to be against charity as well, so none of it makes sense to me, really, how they can call themselves permaculturists if they can't even get past the, the, the three key ethics of it, but there you have it. So anyway, the main point being, these ethics are, are, are ripe for any sort of leftist movement, and these are, the, these are things that we should all have in our mind. Um, yeah, that's, that's, I can't really say anything more about that. The three ethics collaborate together and are interwoven with one another. Okay, our first question is, in regards to permaculture ethics, what is your stance on food forests being open to the general public? In other words, what is your experience with unregulated food forest areas and what systems, e.g. volunteers, have you set up for day-to-day -day functioning? When it comes to food forests, this is one of the best systems that can be designed to provide food with minimal maintenance, once established, for maximum yield over time. And I'm already feeling another link coming up. I'm going to give you a link to one of the most famous uh, food forests in, in North America. I believe it's called the Beacon Hill. Beacon Hill Food Forest. Yeah, there we go. So this food forest is in Seattle. Um, right there, they got the, the permaculture ethics, or principles right up at the front. Um, they got the, the, the ethics as well. And basically all they did was they turned a, an, a basically an, an, a derelict lot, an unused lot in an urban, in urban part of, of Seattle into a food forest where Everything is is um, everything is is a food plant of some kind. So you have food trees, you have food flowers, you have all sorts of things, and people can just come and and collect as they like. You know, it's it's open for everyone. So it's it really embodies that that returning of surplus, and the care for people and the care for Earth. I mean, they they all are interlocking. It's hard to have one without the other, really. Um, so we won't we won't go into this video quite yet. I may add that to the end of the queue if I can find it on YouTube. I'm sure I can. But for now, uh, yeah, just check out Beacon Food Forest if you're interested in the idea of food forest. And we will circle back to this topic later on in our programming here. Because they're incredibly long term. They function exactly as a forest. Now, over the long term, the knowledge is just about something you inherit from generation to generation because it gets more and more refined. Initially, it's a system that's quite controversial. It looks quite unusual and can look quite untidy as it establishes in kind of the middle age point or the adolescent point of a food forest. So as long as there's some good education, once people understand that you get through that sort of rampant stage, you get through that adolescent untidy stage and then it starts to look refined. It starts to look like an actual forest and now it takes less and less maintenance and more and more sort of tuning to get the production really happening. So food fires can provide a community as a, it can provide a service and opportunities, both for volunteers and paid staff. So you'll always have a lot of volunteers, but you need the paid staff to develop the skill base and make sure it keeps evolving to that long-term plan where it can be totally admired as a stable system. It's just that initial stage. So you need a shift in how we manage public lands for this to happen. It, it, it's not gonna just happen straight away, but it's already happened in many parts of the world and even in major cities now. So also private lands can be established as kind of a land trust or similar. That's, that's actually covered in chapter 14 of the Permaculture Designers Manual. So private lands can be examples that then public lands can copy and private lands can be converted into land trusts. 
where there's kind of a condition that it stays in a trust as long as the food forest keeps being maintained through its long-term stability. With proper design, these systems can build soil, provide ecosystem services, and maintain themselves, so that's definitely earth care, while providing resources for the local community. That's people care. With local systems to return food waste via compost, to return surplus manures, to actually return surplus food to the community for people in need, or people who are homeless, or people who just need an education because there's a surplus of information in there. That's return of surplus. In every way, these systems follow the ethics of permaculture. Okay, second question. Hey Jeff, I'm wondering if you could give some practical examples of how you factor in the ethics when going through a design. Is it something that you explicitly design around or do they happen to be integrated as a result of good design? A couple of real world examples would be great, thanks. All right, it's definitely something we work around ethics. We, we, ethics is central to permaculture. There's no question about that. All our designs are centered on the ethics. Absolutely. But also good design expresses the eth ethics. Mm. So one of our classic sites I've been working on lately is Dave Rastovich's garden at Broken Head near Byron Bay, Australia, which is near here. Now Dave lives on a community where eight people, eight families, so multiple people, live down his private Must. road. We work to design a garden that handles the wet climate of our coast here on a very clay soil and work with Dave to build a garden that will produce enough food for the eight families of the community. The project was founded to provide food for the local community, so that's definitely people care. Specific design choices are made based on the profile of land to maximize water infiltration while allowing excess water to flow through the system with the heavy soils in a way that stops any erosion. So again, it's earth care. With the community returning its surplus, the third ethic, they're returning surplus, organic matter, prunings, food waste, and any man surplus manures anybody's got on a property like horse manure to the garden for worm farms and for composting and some surplus work when heavy jobs need to be done. In return, Dave's intention is to produce everybody's food for those eight families and particularly the children all get to learn about the experience. There's a big learning experience in this particular site to recover the clay soils into production, bring them alive, and also to handle the constant heavy rains. So it's surplus in information as it builds this sort of framework of application. So ethics keep coming out of one particular site just because the intention was ethical in the first place with the design. If this interests you, I have some exciting news for you. We're launching our 2000 and 21 online permaculture design certificate for anybody looking to learn more and dive deeper into permaculture design thinking. And I've, I've heard some actual pretty good things about his, his online permaculture course. Uh, it's definitely not going to be as, as hands-on as if you were in a, a classroom with just, you know, a, a dozen or two dozen people. But you're going to get teaching from, you know, one of the world's foremost scholars and, and practitioners of permaculture. And they, they do for your final design project, because that's one of the key components of a permaculture design certificate class, is that you have a final project that you present that is uh, scrutinized by an individual. Um, and you, you'll work very closely with them as well. So it, it seems like a good way to do it. And, and it tends to be lower cost. And also, you know, if you tend to not, if you, if you just happen to be in a, a place that's not close to where permaculture design certificates are offered, uh, th this can be a good option for you too. Uh, as long as you have internet access. Um, but otherwise, like I, I took my certificate course. Let me get, let me just get my certificate right here. Oh yeah, so I'm gonna oh, I gotta bring up the thing again so you can take a look at, at what I've done here. So there you go. This is my permaculture design. This is my permaculture design certificate. Uh, I took it with Big River Permaculture. Uh, in 2016 um, 
with uh, Rob Cernick. Rob is, is, is a fantastic permaculture teacher. Uh, he really was, was good at integrating not just the design concepts and the, and the ethics, but he really brought in, without saying it explicitly, a lot of, of um, leftist ideas, intersectionality, um, caring for disadvantaged people, uh, empowering disadvantaged people. Um, he's, he's a phenomenal teacher. So if you happen to be in the Twin Cities Metro, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't kept up with him real well, um, but I, th I think he, he does still teach permaculture design certificate courses. So Big, Big River Permaculture is the one to look out for there. Otherwise, you know, just check out your local area and um, yeah, go, go from there. Oops, uh, I gotta get back to the video itself. Here we go. Using the three ethics as a foundation will help you move towards food security and water security for you and your community by teaching you efficient and meaningful design. Learn how to maximize production potential on any site around the globe. Learn a variety of soil building techniques that create living soils. And, and just as, as a preview of, of where we're heading next, uh, we are going to be getting into an actual permaculture design course that was, um, they put up a lot of their, their lectures online from Oregon State University. So we'll be going through a lot of this stuff. Support nutrient dense food production, how to work with patterning to make the most efficient use of any landscape. Permaculture design is all about patterning. Not only landscape patterns, but human activity patterns, livestock management patterns, time patterns and more. Learn climate specific techniques to infiltrate and store water in the landscape or pacify. Now, that was a big technique that he used in, in his Greening the Desert project. Algeria, I think, is where he did it. Large flows in wet climates to minimize erosion. Weekly Q&As with me to clarify any question you have throughout the course. And helpful team of teaching assistants ready to support your learning experience. Learn how to design your world of abundance with us and sign up using the link below. So uh, next, we're, I think we're going to do one more look at the, the ethics to see, you know, it, it helps to do this, this kind of repetition thing, get it from a few different angles. Oh. The mute just for the beginning here for the music. So this this is the, the permaculture design certificate course through Oregon State University. And from, from what I can tell, it looks to be a fantastic course. All right. As I've mentioned before, permaculture is an ethically based design system. There are three ethics at the core of permaculture. And the first one is earth care. where we're directed to protect natural systems and rebuild degraded ones. The fact is, the Earth is a living, breathing, interconnected ecological whole. And if we don't take care of keeping water clean and abundant, soils rich and healthy, forests intact and biodiverse, and air clean and breathable, then we will not have the conditions for our own life. The next ethic is people care. If we design with the health and well-being of people in mind, then people have the security and stability to take good care of the lands they live in. People in intact and robust communities are empowered and can make good choices. So people care is at the core of a permaculture design. The third ethic is called fair share. And it relates to limiting consumption and putting surplus back into the first two ethics of earth care and people care. It's not just sustainable for a small amount of people to accumulate more and more wealth while many around them don't have enough. The imperative is to take... So, so it's basically the reverse of a trickle-down economic system. So instead of hoarding everything at the top, you as a person uh, with whatever abundance you have, and that doesn't have to be just physical material things. It could be time, it could be care, 
Uh, it can be any, any number of things, just whatever you have to give to your local community um, and giving it freely without any, any, uh, without any um, requirement of, of a return um, in any direct way. Um, other than just feeling good about what you're doing and, and knowing that you're being an ethical person. Uh, so that that's more of a mutual aid approach to uh, redistribution. So it's it's uh, yeah, instead of um, instead of trickle down, it's it's really grassroots um, from the roots up uh, or bubble up maybe. Excess, excess wealth and use it to help others. Right. Invest it into restoring the natural capital of the Earth's ecosystems. You could say that this massive, free, open online course is taking the surplus of Oregon State University and giving it back to the world community in the form of this educational offering. You cannot have a stable and enduring civilization that does not address equity, the distribution of resources, and the causes of poverty as they relate to land degradation and pollution. Hi, I'm Mike. All right, uh, so now we're going to hear from Mike Hogue. This is a guy I know uh, I met online through the Permaculture Group on Facebook, and he's now started his own really fantastic group. Um, and he has, uh, uh, he's, he's basically very knowledgeable in, in all things permaculture. Um, so he's going to talk about what is not permaculture. So we're going to get a little bit of a, a definition through removal. Mike Hogue of Transformative Adventures. Transformative Adventures. I'd like Adventures. to talk a little bit about the permaculture ethics and how we use those and apply them. See, I've had a lot of questions lately. In fact, I always have this question about how we use the permaculture ethics, especially with this uh, idea of um, this sort of configuration. X behavior does not follow the permaculture ethics. I find very often when people start to think of permaculture as a system for judging other people, that they end up both unhappy with permaculture and with other people. And so that leads me to believe that permaculture might not be a very good tool to use for the purpose of judging other people's behaviors and actions. So we'll look at that in a second. But if permaculture's ethics and principles were not created to judge other people's uh, behaviors, what was the purpose of them? Well, it turns out Bill Molson and David Holmgren have given us a few reasons and a few uh, ways to use the ethics and principles. Whenever we start to design something, we usually start with the idea of money first. And usually we don't consider the ethics at all. So permaculture, he says, starts with consideration of ethics first. So we know we're being involved in that. So from that perspective, the point and use of the permaculture ethics and principles is as a design tool. And the second use that Mollison gives is as an ethic, a shared ethic, to help us establish an alternative global nation. So in that case, the point of the ethics is to communicate to others our values as permaculturists. And this is now, and to do those two jobs, are the permaculture ethics and principles uh, a very good tool? I would say, yes, they are. They're very good tools for those two specific uh, jobs. One of the reasons why is they're very short they're, they're um, very concise, and they're just enough to get us to tap in to thinking about ethics and considering them. But once we start using them to assess the actions and behaviors of other people, we, we may start to find that they have some uh, big drawbacks. When we think about the evolution of ethics, I'm sure that they went something a lot like, a lot like this. You know, you start with just the idea that everybody should be pretty nice to each other, right? And soon you find somebody else doesn't want to follow that and goes around punching everybody. So then you think, well, I guess I shouldn't have to be nice to that guy, should I? So that just be nice to people or people care, 
might not be a very complex enough ethic in order to help us really solve that problem. Do we be nice to that guy or do we pop him off and kill him? Uh, then we have to come up with a thou shalt not kill kind of ethic. And so we have a whole history of, ethical con of ethics and ethical considerations and ethical philosophy um, that has gone on for thousands of years. For example, I would consider the system of ethics that I use in order to judge my own behavior and understand the behavior of others, maybe a better way of putting it than the sort of judging that we often see with the application of the permaculture ethics and principles. And these are... Okay. Uh, so, Jfreak7 says, what if you don't want to give it all away? Uh, you're talking about the, the surplus? I mean, that, that's definitely up to you, but if it's a surplus, then kind of by definition, it's something that you don't need for yourself. Um, and it's okay to, to like store things for, say, a rainy day, that sort of situation. You definitely want to be prepared if, if there's unforeseen shocks to the system that, that you may need a little bit extra than you normally would. Um, but if you don't want to give it all away, I mean, that's your prerogative, but I don't think you're necessarily working within a permaculture framework then. Um, so I guess that's just something you'll have to grapple with yourself. It, it just, if you want to do permaculture, you should probably deal within, you should probably try to work within permaculture ethics and principles. Otherwise, just, I guess, do something different, right? Um, but why wouldn't you want to give it all away? Why wouldn't you want to give away your surplus? Um, why wouldn't you want to see your community thrive and, and do better? I guess that would be my, my question to you are the very similar ideas in sort of Epicurean philosophy and in Buddhist philosophy of skillful means. In this understanding of ethics, generally we think that people are trying to do the best that they can to be happy, but some people use unskillful ways to seek happiness and some people use more skillful ways. But even people who are acting unskillfully still want the same things that I want. They just want to be happy the same way that I do. It gives me an, a, a way of finding compassion with them and it also gives me a way for understanding their behavior that's much more complex than they don't care about keep people care. Sure they do. They may care about people care just as much as I do. Maybe they're just going about valuing people care in a way that isn't as skillful as it could be. This also gives me a better way to interact with them because if I can understand that what they really want is to seek happiness and to care for people, even if only themselves, then the key to that then is just simply to help them understand that their way of seeking uh, um, happiness could be improved. They could seek happiness in more skillful ways and not have a bunch of angry people around them all the time who don't like them. I would choose my own set of ethics over the permaculture ethics and principles. They're just a better tool for me to assess behavior. But at the same time, that idea about ethics would not be a very good design tool for me in going about designing a garden or a home or a community garden or an organization. The permaculture ethics and principles and complete design system is a much better tool for doing that job than uh, Epicurean or Buddhist ethics. But I'm not going to tell you what to believe. What do you think? Do you think that the permaculture ethics are a very good tool for uh, judging people's behaviors? Do you think that uh, the executives of ExxonMobil, say, don't believe that they are caring for people and caring for the earth? What do you think about Adolf Hitler? Do you think Adolf Hitler was sitting around thinking, I'm going to be bad to the earth and bad to people, and I don't care that it's not fair? Probably. He felt that what he was doing was good. He so I'm going to end this video with a thought of what is permaculture's prime directive. The prime directive isn't judge other people. <laughs> the prime directive is that the only ethical decision is to take care of ourselves or take responsibility for ourselves and for our families. When it comes to the actions of other people, we may have a lot of different ways we can design to interact with them. 
that may be more effective than just judging them, in my view. In fact, that would be another thing. If we're doing permaculture design, we would start with consideration of our ethics. Is judging someone a way of caring for people? Does that care for the earth? And then we would look for patterns to achieve our goals after we set goals. For In this case, our goal might be to change the behavior of the person involved. So then we would look at patterns for how best to change that person's behavior. As it turns out, uh, expressing judgment and negative feedback is usually not a, a research-based approach for changing people's behaviors. So more research-based approaches might be building long-term social capital with them, catching and storing social capital in the form of head and heart authority with them so that they believe that you're a good quality source of information and that you care about the same things that they do and you hear them and you listen to them. Another tool might be listening first to understand and then to be understood so that you can understand why, why it is that they're doing the things that they want to do, what motivates them, and how they think that is going to lead to happiness so that you can help them see better modes of moving towards happiness. And a third thing is that often we think the best way to change someone's behavior is to change their mind, possibly by calling them names or saying that they're not following the permaculture ethics and principles. But in reality, the best way to change someone's mind is by first changing their behavior. If you can get someone to adapt their behavior, even in a temporary condition, they will start to th understand why that behavior works and they'll start to see themselves as the kind of person who does that kind of behavior. So, okay, so, so what I'm, what I'm seeing from the points that, that Mike here is making is that basically what he's saying is if you're using the permaculture ethics to say, you know, you don't live up to the standard, you don't live up to the standard, you don't live up to the standard. And so you're all bad. You're all uh, canceled to use a really cliche word. Um, you know, if you're using it just to separate yourself from other people, make yourself feel better then I mean, really, are you, are you applying the ethics yourself? Probably not. But the ethics should be seen more as something that you yourself find value in, that you aspire to, and that you try to live by. And then through your inspiring example and through, you know, being, uh, uh, I want to say careful, but that's not, that's not exactly the word I want to use, but tr trying to, to help people learn uh, the way that you view the world and, and start to think about why you may think there's alternative paths that we maybe should be taking. Um, as, 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 as you're setting a good example, uh, I'm sorry, I've, I've kind of lost my train of thought there, but, but anyway, the point being, if you're using the, the ethics to, to better yourself, then people will be inspired by the things that you do. And then you can come back and, and help guide them rather than chide them, I guess is a, is, a, is a good way of putting it. So you're not saying you better do this. You got to do that. You know, you're not as good. We're, we're, you know, it's important to keep in mind we are all on a journey. None of us started out with all the, the, the philosophies and ethics and principles completely intact from day one. From, you know, it's not like the, anyone's first word was, you know, I believe in, in these ethics and everyone else is a traitor to humanity, you know, <laughs> basically. We, we all had to, to get here from some other place. So, so be kind to people as, as you try and, and guide them on their journey and, and don't do it in a condescending or arrogant way where you're excluding this and excluding that, but try and pull them into your worldview. I think that's, that's basically Mike's point, and I, I would tend to agree with that. And also keep in mind that, that almost everyone, uh, especially people in power, believe themselves to be the hero of their own story. So, you, like you said, you, you, you might go up to the CEO of a, a very powerful corporation who's doing tremendous harm to the earth, just objectively doing tremendous harm. And they may still think, well, yes, but, uh, you know, I got us to, to adopt these practices here, so we're not quite as bad. And, well, you know, people need energy. What are you going to do? We're an energy company. Well, you know, they, they, they'll have excuses. And, and so it's, it's not enough to just say, well, no, but these are the ethics that you should be living by. You're not living up to them. You have to go beyond that and say, here's a, here's a deeper understanding of these ethics. Here's why 
I want us to, to change course. Here's how we think we can change course and get away from these harmful practices using these, these design ethics and these, this design framework of permaculture. Um, I, I, would, I would tend to agree that, that that would tend to be a more productive path to take rather than just, no, 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 you're all bad, basically. Although there is a place for that. There's a place for calling out bad actors and, um, yeah, like, I mean, I do it all the time on this channel. <laughs> uh, people that I think are doing real harm, it, it's sometimes all you can do is, is call them out because you're, you know, for them to be called in, for them to be coming in, you know, in a place where they can even absorb your worldview, they have to be willing to listen. And that's not always the case. So sometimes you just got to point out their hypocrisy. You have to point out the damage that they're doing and let other people see for themselves and hopefully abandon following that person as a leader um, and start following more healthy, productive, uh, in terms of social change sorts of people. Another tool that we can use there is simply modeling better behavior. Yeah, Sometimes so. you don't have to reach out and try to control someone else and change their behavior through brute force. You can contribute what you would like to see to the situation instead. And so there, there are different types of levers of power and there are different ways to exert influence on the world and other people. And some are going to be more appropriate for one situation versus another. Um, there may be times, like I said, where you have a really hateful, uh, disgusting person, say some, some, you know, fascist of some type who is, who is doing demonstrable harm to the community. And the best thing you can do is, is destroy what they're doing in whatever way you can, whether that's humiliating them or just physically preventing them from, from harming others or what have you. Um, sometimes that is the only choice, but that's not always the most appropriate choice. You know, if you're talking about just, uh, say like, uh, electoral politics, probably not the best idea to just completely try and destroy and trash other people. Um, maybe better idea to, to positively organize towards real change rather than spend all your time just mauling over the things that, that politicians say and the, the empty promises that they tend to make. Another tool that I should mention is nonviolent communication. Okay, but I'm not going to tell you what to think. You can figure that out for yourself. What do you think? Are the permaculture ethics and principles a good tool for judging other people? Or should we keep them focused on what they were intended to do in the first So right, in, in, in situations where you can give, where you can give people space to grow and learn, um, and maybe consider things that, in a way that they haven't before, that may be the best route to do. Say, what do you think about this stuff? What, what are you going for? And then you can just start gently nudging, saying, well, you know, I see that you're trying to be an ethical person by following this or that code, uh, but perhaps that's leading to, to damage and here's why, you know? And then you can give them room to breathe and grow. It doesn't have to be publicly. It could be away from everybody. They can, people, should be able to have space sometimes to get things in better order, I guess. Um, so there, there are definitely appropriate times for that method as well. First place, which is help us create designs. Because if we don't answer that question right, we're likely to end up in a lot of frustrating situations. And then we'll be frustrated with permaculture too. Thanks. All right, so that, that was Mike Ho. You can check out, uh, oh boy, let me go find his. Ah, so the amazing Wolf Skeptic, hello to you as well. Uh, so you've been here before uh, to this particular stream. Well, welcome back, if that's the case. Yes, your quick question, go for it, shoot. We're talking about permaculture tonight, so let's, let's keep that in mind, please. Uh, how, are, how am I today? I'm doing well. Um, yeah, I had a nice day off. Got to, to, to spend time with my kids. Um, we played some hide and seek, which we hadn't done in a while, so that was fun. Um, got to play some Roblox together, so that was cool too. Ah, so so his organization, Mike Hogue's organization, is Transformative Adventures. Uh, so you can look that up on Facebook. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, what were you going to ask? Okay. So, what were you going to ask? And if it's if it's completely unrelated, I may I may just choose to move on, and we'll deal with it another time. But just go ahead for now. Marxist Leninist regimes across the world. Do I support them? Um, I mean, I guess you'd have to define what those regimes were, and and what you mean by support. Do I am I blindly in support of, of any government? Um, no, absolutely not. Are there other governments that I, I like more than others? Absolutely. Um, so you'd have to be more specific about that. I can't just answer that that generically. Anyway, Transformative Adventures, that is his, his organization. Um, and then you have Permaculture Landscape Transformation via Transformative, or Permaculture Landscape Transformation via Transformative Adventures. That's his other page on Facebook, so go check those out. Uh, they're pretty cool. I'll go ahead and put those. Whoops. Uh, so yeah, Mike Hogue, pretty cool guy. Okay, <laughs> a lot of stuff here. Oh, Cuba, Vietnam, People's Republic of China. I support, I mean, those are very different countries for one thing, but I would say that I support them to some degree and, and, and not in other respects. Speaking very generally, um, I don't know as much about Vietnam specifically, but, but China and, and Cuba tend to be less open with uh, the flow of information. They, they tend to be more, more of a closed uh, society, as I understand it, and I tend not to like that. I, I like more free-flowing ideas understanding that, that some ideas can actually be dangerous, and I, I understand that that's why they tend to, to keep things closed. Um, I, I haven't studied Mao specifically, so it's hard for me to, to actually answer that question. I just don't have a good enough opinion about it. Um, but, but yeah, in, in terms of, of caring for their people, um, in all three of those countries, uh, that you listed, they have done wondrous things to pull their people up out of poverty. Um, Cuba has one of the best health systems in the world. They, they, they just developed their own vaccine for the, the coronavirus and are, and are helping other countries get access to it. Uh, China has made huge technological advances. Uh, they're the first to get 5G wireless networks. So they've done some great things as well. It's hard to say, <laughs> you know, they're very com you know, we were talking about complex countries, especially China with over a billion people. It's hard to say, oh, yes, I like them or I dislike them. That's, that's just, do you like America? Do you dislike America? Like, how, how do you answer that question? Yeah, so, so in any case where they would be uh, suppressing the LGBTQ community, I would definitely be against those sorts of policies for sure. There's no defending that. I, I, I'm not the kind of person that's going to defend any country just because it, it happens to be going against um, imperialism or whatever. I think we can definitely criticize countries and, and, and specifically policies where they are harming people. For sure. There's no reason we can't. Uh, so you're of the belief that Fidel Castro did a, a, a lot to greatly help the proletariat movements? I, I would tend to agree with that. But at the same time, as a fan of the bread tube, I'm always against censorship. Yeah, okay. So censorship is a, is a very delicate issue. Um, wow, I mean, that's, that's, that's a whole, uh, that could definitely be an, an entire stream unto itself. Um, but in general, I, I, I definitely lean more against censorship. So yeah, as I was saying, having more of a closed society, uh, I, I tend to be against that sort of idea. I like the free flowing of information and ideas. I don't like people getting in trouble just for not having the right ideas, I guess. And, you know, that's the way I can put it. Yeah, Conquest of Bread, that's, that's the book that we are just about to finish up. Uh, this, this coming Friday evening at, at 7 p.m., we will be doing part two of chapter 17, the, the, the closing chapter of The Conquest of Bread. Um, so yeah, st you know, tune back in for that, please. Um, so yeah. Yeah, so yeah. In, in most cases, I would be against censorship. I think there does need to be limits when you're starting to cause harm. And that's always a very, that's never gonna be a clear and bright line, what causes harm, how much is significant harm, that sort of thing. 
but I think we can come to some broad understandings. If you are calling for the genocide of an entire people, you are causing harm. If you are actively making plans to target uh, people that, that have done nothing to you, that, that, that you only hate because of some immutable characteristics such as their race or their gender, or their sexual orientation, their, whatever it may be. Yeah, if you, if you are actively contributing to the harming of, of people for those reasons, I can see a, a need for, for a certain degree of censorship. Um, but just ideas of like, hey, I think we should organize society this way. I think it's that. It should be that way. You know, even as far as like, you know, I believe in strict hierarchies versus I believe in a very um, anarchic, non-hierarchical system. I think those are okay ideas to, to have out in the public and debate because they're not necessarily targeting any one specific group. Um, and they're not actively causing harm necessarily. Even that's arguable. Even the idea of, of, of um, promoting capitalism could be seen as, as itself causing harm because capitalism does so much harm around the world um, and in the, in the countries where it is. So, but, but just for what I believe myself, I think those sorts of ideas are okay to have free flow of. Hmm. So you say that I don't think it's really debated if censorship and police brutality in Cuba is common, but at the same time, I think it's uh, the way that they structure the police is slightly better than most Western policing systems. I mean, I, I don't have uh, a, any sort of opinion on, on Cuba's police force. Um, I, I don't know anything about them. I've not researched that myself, so um, I don't have a good response for that. Uh, when it comes to defending and helping the workers and and people of color, even though the police is inherently a racist, white supremacist institution. Hmm. I think definitely under a capitalist system, it is inherently a racist and white supremacist institution because hierarchical systems tend to favor uh, the people that just have the majority of power, which happens to be white people just on average globally. Um, I don't know that a, a, any sort of a, I mean, when it comes down to it, you still probably want to have some people to deal with super violent altercations, right? You don't want to have some sort of a crime family coming in and, and trying to take over a neighborhood or a city and, and running it as they please and, and violently suppressing that, just forming a different form of, of authoritarian government. We don't want that. Um, but yeah. Probably 96%, and, and the, statistics, the statistics bear that out, that 90, something like 96% of what police do in the U.S., um, including all paperwork related to, to each type of crime, 96% is not related to violent crime at all. Only 4% on average, and this is on average, is related to violent, violent crime. And, and those averages were taken from large cities. It wasn't just from... Um, you know, small municipalities where, where nothing happens. But, but anyway, yeah, we definitely need to drastically reorganize the way police do things at a minimum and, and then kind of go from there. That would be my opinion. Uh, okay. Yeah, everyone supports censorship to a degree. And in fact, you know, any of the right wingers that, that squawk all the time about de being deplatformed and, and getting banned from Twitter or Facebook or whatever would delight in nothing more than having every leftist person, you know, literally made to shut up forever. They're the same people that are, that are trying to ban critical race theory from being practiced in school. When they don't, they can't even define it in the first place. They just, they just think it's, you know, white person bad. That's the entirety of the theory, which is absolutely not true. But these are the same people that, that are always pro censorship as long as it's for something that they um, are against. And that's not my. That's not the same for for my side. That's not the same for the left. You know, we will we will definitely tolerate a wide array of dea, of ideas that are outside of the left, as long as they're not actively ca causing harm. And I think that's the the key difference there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I would I would hope that most people would agree that censorship of child pornography is a good thing because that is causing harm, actively causing harm. I think that that has to be the standard of, of censorship. Does it actively cause harm? 
So, Alio, sure, you say, I don't know if you realize, but my mom is Cuban, hates Castro, very unpopular in, on Twitch, but uh, not trying to cause Twitch trouble. But MAGA is ridiculous. Yeah, and, you know, again, any one of those countries, Cuba, Vietnam, China, I haven't studied extensively. Um, when I look at examples of, of the sorts of societies that, that I would like to live in, I would first say that, that we should move towards the, the Scandinavian societies um, that, that have ro very robust um, public welf welfare systems. Losing your job doesn't mean you lose your life or, or risk losing your health care, which could lead to you losing your life. Um, they believe in supporting their people. They have very strong and robust unions. It is definitely declined as the entire world has since the time of Reaganomics and, and Margaret Thatcher and, and that sort of thing. But, but overall, a better, more robust public welfare system and more, much higher degree of union participation. I think that would be an amazing, if we could get to the America to that point, man, within my lifetime, I would be overjoyed, overjoyed. Universal health care, guaranteed right to, to housing um, and, and other necessities of life. Oh, that would be amazing. And then if we're going to move beyond that point, I think some models such as uh, uh, Rojava, where they, where they have what's known as democratic confederalism, uh, a much more horizontally structured society where you have local meetings that are direct democracies that then take their issues to you know, higher levels to, to make broader policy, um, as well as the Zapatista movement. I think those are much better models for, for what we should be shooting for over even you know China, Cuba, Vietnam, these, these countries that have held on to one degree or, or another, um, some semblance of, of socialism, I, I think. I think that's fair to say. Um, let's see. I wouldn't defend Castro for firing squads, yep, but I will defend his policies of nationalization and worker co-ops and, and bringing about land back to revolutionary charge. Yeah, I mean, they've done incredible things with... Um, uh, getting farmers to, to work and and producing a, a high degree of the, the amount of food that the country subsists on. They, they produce, I, I think it's still most of their own food just on that, that small island. Um, that's been phenomenal. And they do it without uh, nearly as much heavy machinery. Um, so they, they've made huge strides in, in protecting wildlife. They've done a lot of great things, for sure. It's... Um, I don't think you can say entirely bad things about them or any of these countries, but uh, Cuba San Isidro movement on YouTube. Okay, I will I will I will take a look at that, Ali. Thank you very much for that. After all, Cubans' healthcare has been rated the best in the world. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I mentioned that just a couple minutes ago. They've done phenomenal things with their healthcare system. So, and they also they they have eliminated homelessness in the country, which is something that that you only see in, in quote-unquote Western societies in countries such as Sweden, where they have super robust uh, welfare programs. Otherwise, homelessness is a, a chronic problem wherever you go. And it's because of hierarchy and, and not caring for people that really need it um, based on these, these horrible capitalist myths that if you're homeless, you somehow deserve it, or if you're poor, you somehow deserve it. And that we somehow actually live in an egalitarian or a, a merit, meritocratic society where the best of the best just naturally rise to lofty positions and everyone else just filters in where they're meant to be. It's just not how it happens. It's just not. And it, it hurts people. Uh, is becoming a father helped you open up to more revolutionary political causes? You know, I haven't given it a whole lot of thought. Um, my, my, my oldest son is 11 years old, so I've been a father a lot longer than I've been a leftist, that's for sure. Um, I only really started calling myself an anarchist of any kind in maybe around 2015, I would say, and then didn't really even get into theory, like actual leftist theory, until uh, a couple years ago. So um, there's definitely an element of it. I definitely want to, very much to lead, uh, leave a, a better world to... to my children, I want them to grow up with, with every possibility of, of succeeding. I don't want 
baseline subsistence to ever be something that holds them back for sure. So that, that definitely does help shape my ideas. Um, so yeah, but, uh, yeah. Okay. So just, uh, Oh, Hey, Tribunus Plebis. Hey, how's it going? Uh, everyone follow Tribunus Plebis. I, I don't know if they have any content out on, on Twitch yet, but they have a phenomenal, um, podcast that they put out periodically. Um, he's been on, on this show a number, uh, a couple different times. That's always been a blast. Um, so hello to you as well. I hope you're doing well tonight. Um, very, I'm glad you're enjoying the stream. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry, Alyosha. You can whisper me the link, and um, I'll, I'll put it out there if I can. I just want to get through this one video, and then we're gonna we're probably going to wrap it up for the night here. So this is a, a short one, just, just under five minutes. We're going to learn about the foundations of permaculture design. So stick with me. And I appreciate the, the discussion. Um, and, you know, tangents, tangents are fine from time to time as long as they're productive. So I do appreciate the, the questions. Thank you very much. The permaculture design process itself is regenerative, like a tree. The process starts by studying the workings of the natural world. This part of the design process is like the tree's root system. We want to see how the water flows, how the wind blows, how the soils are deposited, how fire moves through the landscape, and how the plants arrange themselves. We want to observe the norms and extremes of weather and climate. This is the study of ecology, botany, hydrology, climatology, and many others. We also want to observe the patterns of humans. How did indigenous people inhabit a place? Where did they plant their crops? Where did they set up their villages? After long and protracted observation, we conduct a site analysis. This is where we map the forces and flows of the site. If we've taken the time to do a thorough site analysis, the design becomes obvious. I always caution students about trying too hard on the design. If it's not coming easily, then perhaps Sorry, you need to do more observations. So you can find this entire playlist if you just go to my channel on uh, YouTube. You just look for, search for Bread Theory, and uh, it is under, where is it now? LS, LSB TV, because I originally put this out as, as a podcast, or not a podcast, as a stream on Facebook for um, my group, Left Signal Boost. Um, I used to do this. I, I'm going to keep on doing it, but I, I do this thing from time to time where I just load up a queue of, of videos or podcasts and just let them, let them go on the, on the stream to expose people to more ideas. All right, so we'll get that back up. Study. Uh, okay, so Amazing Wolf Skeptic says, I'll be honest, I'm an anarchist, but I'm an insubordinate to authority. I, I, I definitely feel that. And I've always been skeptical of government and capitalist overlords. Yeah, I, I can definitely appreciate that point of view. Um, at the same time, there's definitely degrees of, of better and worse uh, than, I, I don't know where you're coming from, but, but for myself coming from the U.S. Alberta, Canada. All right. The Texas of Canada. Ah, we're actually not too far apart. I live in Minnesota. So, cool. Happy to have you on, on the stream. So here's the link from Ali Osher. To check out the San Isidro movement. I don't, I don't know anything about this, so, uh, but it's just a YouTube link, so you should be able to, to open that out without too much, um, without too much problem. <laughs> it's Trump's army. That's funny. Anyway, let's let's finish up this video real quick because I'm already going over the time that that I said I would. So. Design is the trunk of the tree. Permaculture has principles and methods to guide this process which we'll be getting to later on in the course. The permaculture design system is where we get into the details of how to arrange systems for different climate types, from drylands to tropics to the temperate zones, mountains to valleys, coastal to inland regions. The design becomes an interconnection of systems, including water, roads, trees, building, buildings, gardens, fences, and more. After design comes implementation, building the systems. The systems can be anything from a small balcony garden to a sprawling farm or ranch. The techniques will differ, but the basic design system remains the same. 
And that's what we'll be looking at in this course. And finally, feedback. This is where permaculture stands out among other design systems and that the feedback loop is built in. Just as the roots of a tree pull water and nutrients from far and near, deep and shallow, permaculture design pulls knowledge from many areas. With permaculture design, we look at every aspect of human settlements in the environment. Permaculture addresses political, economic, and social systems as part of the design. Non-physical structures like commerce, governance, finance, and access to land makes the physical structures like ponds, orchards, homes, and villages possible. So the roots of the permaculture design tree are fed by the fields of energy, finances, economics, ecology, anthropology, architecture, geography, horticulture, agriculture, biology, botany, engineering, urban planning, hydrology, forestry, marine sciences, and many more. Those nutrients are taken up into the wood of the trunk of the permaculture design system tree, which is based on ethics and principles. That tree then grows leaves, and the fruits are harvested through the design and development of farms, homes, villages, towns, communities, businesses, gardens, plantations, aquaculture systems, and others. Permaculture is a way to steer our society towards a just, abundant, and enduring future. So how does, how does that sit with everyone? Does that make sense? Are we tracking this? I know it can be... He's, he threw a lot of terms at you all at once there. Uh, yeah, a lot of stuff that he put up around there. But basically the idea is, is you're taking all these inputs and you're, you're putting them into um, something that, that you're filtering them through the ethics and design principles and you're coming out with something that's, that's sustainable, that, that gives to everybody, um, provides abundance and, and um, uh, a yield uh, that you can then help other people with. So, so yeah, that's just a, that's just a little taste of, of what we're going to be going through. We're going to be doing a whole lot of these videos next time, but I think that's that's it for tonight because I'm already almost a half hour late in in getting off here, uh, getting off the stream. So, um, with that, uh, if you like this sort of thing and you're watching the audience, please give me a follow so that you'll be alerted to uh, my my future videos or my future streams. That is, uh, you can always check me out by going to my link tree. You can take a look there at l-a-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash bread underscore theory. You can find links to my Twitch, my, my YouTube. I mean, if you're watching on Twitch right now, you obviously know that one. But uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, you can buy my art. You can uh, look at the various groups that I'm a part of on Facebook, such as Left Pod Posting and Left Signal Boost, um, and all kinds of cool stuff. So, yeah. So go there and you can follow me in all the places. Uh, and then until next time, friends, Lek Tam. So just stick with me one moment and we will raid into Freems, another cool leftist uh, streamer here on Twitch. You have a you have a good night too, Alyosha. Thank you, uh, Sean from Tribunus Plebes. Thanks to everyone who, who uh, made comments, Amazing Wolf Skeptic. Thanks for all the discussion. I really appreciate it. Um, solidarity to you out in, in Alberta. I know it can be hard if you're in a place that, that doesn't think much the way you do. So, uh, yeah, keep fighting the good fight. Freems, and I'll send you to Freems right now. Thanks so much, folks.